Welcome and thank you so much for <coughs> all coming this evening. Um, Sir Basil Spence, along with his um, rough contemporary, um, Sir Dennis Lasden, designer of the National Theatre, the two were the f most famous architects of their day. They were akin in more recent times to the statue of Norman Foster and the late Richard Rogers. Between them, Spence and Lasden, hoovering up a fantastic gallery of major commissions which would do much to define post-war architecture from the mid-1950s until both high-tech and post-modernism eclipse them at the middle and the end of the 1970s, respectively. Spence was by then dead, and Lasden, who outlived Spence by a quarter of a century, had just finished the National Theatre, and he was at the pinnacle of his career, but he had, by that point, arguably done much of his best work. I have to turn the volume up, I think, when the trains go past, which happens about every three minutes. So if it sounds like I'm shouting from time to time, you'll understand why. Um, anyway, where were we? Um, so um, Lasden had done, arguably done much of his best work. Um, I'd say that it's fair that neither are really held in the esteem that they perhaps once enjoyed during their career. And I feel it is time for a, a reset. And tonight it is Spence's go. Um, it's quite a tricky subject, this. Dependent on your point of view, Spence's work was radical, pioneering, romantic, contextual, and spiritual, with a great concern for history, beauty, and the human spirit. Or it is brutal, it's certainly brutalist in part, insensitive, crude, and bombastic, and, and sometimes anti-urban. Whatever your viewpoint, I will argue that a deep knowledge and sense of the tradition of architecture and its role in society ran through Spence's work, and the outcomes were built upon experiment and a genuine search for an architecture to establish a bold new frontier in the post-war age. What I hope to do this evening is to shine a light on the man, his motivation and key moments across his enormous herbs, I can only do a little bit, across what I believe to be four seminal and somewhat controversial projects. Some easy ones like Coventry Cathedral, I guess, um, the University of Sussex, more difficult, Hyde Park Cavalry Barracks and 50 Queen Anne's Gate. Um, in so doing, I will touch briefly on the work that my studio is currently undertaking at University of Sussex, one of his, Spence's, and this country's finest collection of post-war university buildings. Um, I should confess to having got you here under slightly false pretenses this evening. Um, I'm not a historian, I'm an architect, um, nor do I until recently hold my, and probably still, hold myself out to be a Spence expert. There are others in the room tonight who definitely are. And Piers Goff tells me that he actually did some labouring on the University of Sussex project site very early in his youth. I've seen your work there, Piers, I think, and it does stand out. Um, so it's with some trepidation, I suppose, that I set out my stool this evening. I'm expecting to be corrected later. Um, uh, the... Um, when I give public talks or lectures, lectures, talks, whatever, it's usually on my own work, the motivations of my studio, the work I do with Richard, my other director and the team. Um, but when Andrew asked if I could give a Docomomo talk, I leapt at it. Well, actually, I didn't leap at it. I said I'd do it. And months later, I told him what I talk about because I hadn't been formally appointed, so I couldn't. But now I can. Um, uh, Andrew asked if I give the Doko moment talk, which I readily accepted because I'm working on the Sussex Uni complex. Um, so it had to be spent, and of course that's why we're here tonight. Um, I've been a long admirer of both Spence and Lasden and what they tried to do. Um, I suppose when you look at it now, you worry about carbon and all that stuff, and they just didn't, and they didn't even think about it. They didn't worry about accessibility and all that stuff. So in a way, we have to sort of park that stuff at the door because it just wasn't what people did in that era. Now we wouldn't do what they do, but we have to judge it in what they did at the time, I believe. Um, so I've long admired both of them, what they tried to do. And the very first book that I read in about five minutes, the first five minutes of architecture school was indeed... Um, Phoenix at Coventry, 
uh, as the building of the cathedral, Spence's own account of perhaps his most celebrated work. Um, there are important publications on Spence's work to which I am indebted, most notably Basil Spence Buildings and Projects. I'm not promoting this, I'm just telling you. Um, uh, by uh, Dr. Louise Campbell of Warwick University, Miles Glendinning and Jane Thomas, um, published in 2012. There are other books too. There are important archives and a whole bunch of stuff on YouTube of varying quality, including the BBC's superb account of the building of Coventry Cathedral and a no doubt fascinating, fascinating interview with Spence on the completion of his British Embassy in Rome in 1971 only marred by the fact there's no soundtrack, which makes it quite difficult to really understand what's going on. <laughs> um, I'm also grateful to um, Professor Maurice Howard and Dr. Alistair Grant at the University of Sussex for their patient tours with me of Spence's campus whilst we are trying to evaluate how best to approach the updating of some of these amazing buildings and looking at the master plan. I hope some of it is, has, has stuck and it's great to see the people from um, the client group at, at uh, the university too. So thank you for making the schlep up from, from Brighton. So Spence was, um, Basil Spence was born in, um, when was he born? 1907. He was born in uh, Bombay, India, 1907. He um, was educated there and then when he was the age, at the age of 12 he was sent to Edinburgh to be to continue his school studies and he enrolled in 1925 at the uh, College of Art to study architecture. Um, he did a stint at Lutchen's office starting in 1929 for about a year and he worked on the um, uh, Viceroy's Palace, uh, uh, Viceroy's uh, house at uh, New, and the New Delhi Master Plan and um, and then studied briefly at the Bartlett before returning to Edinburgh to complete his studies. While still a student, uh, he won lots of prizes and so on and so forth. And here we have one of his rather masterful student drawings, actually. Extraordinary detail and fidelity. He won lots of prizes. He did lots of moonlighting illustration for architectural practices. And he was actually appointed a lecturer while he was still a student, which must have gone down an absolute storm amongst his peer fellow peers studying away and trying to learn this business of architecture. Um, he, um, he set up in the early 30s a fledgling practice doing a couple of house commissions um, and uh, he married in about 1934 and Joan Ferris and the two of them had uh, one daughter, um, Gillian, who later married Anthony Blee who was probably unheralded partner from Spence but did a lot of work for Spence on the major projects and with Spence and perhaps didn't get the recognition he deserved but anyway he was much younger than Spence he married Gillian Spence's daughter and sadly he, he we learned he did I didn't know him but he did pass away a few weeks back um, the uh, so Spence carried on uh, carried on working and the kind of projects he was doing early Doors were fairly traditional. There's a sort of hint of modernity creeping in. There's illustrations for one of the house projects. And he then embraced a kind of modernism um, with a sort of stripped strip back kind of quasi art deco um, exploration um, in a house um, in Scotland called Griblock um, for an industri local industrialist, industrialist, John Colville. Um, the war came. He was called up. Um, he worked, no, he was commissioned as a second lieutenant and he worked in the camouflage and, anyway, the, the, depart, the bit of the army that worries about camouflage and all that stuff. And he worked on the, on the D-Day deception plans. I've got all this wonderfully written down on another page. <laughs> um, somewhere else. Um, he worked on the D-Day deception plans, which was to persuade the Nazis that the Allies were going to invade into the Pas de Calais via Kent and all that stuff. So they built a kind of whole fake city and all sorts of stuff, and he was involved in that. But he did take part in the actual, D in the actual landings, which happened in Normandy, as we know. And whether it was first day, I don't know, but he did take part. Um, he was mentioned twice in dispatches, and he was demobbed in September 1945. He picked up his architectural work, Again, 
and spent a lot of time working on exhibition design because that's mainly what was about. Um, he received the OBE in 1948 for his work on exhibition, for, for his principally for his work in that sector, the exhibition design area, arena, and then worked on the Festival of Britain 1951. This is his Special Ships exhibition, um, which featured um, briefly, well, it featured for the period that the Festival of Britain was, in fact, running. Um, so quite, quite remarkable, but didn't really necessarily point to where Spence was going in his career. Phew, I'm back on page now. <laughs> um, fiercely ambitious, Spence badly wanted much larger projects to engage with. And in 1951, rather he, to his surprise, he won the Open International Architectural Competition to design Coventry Cathedral, the new Coventry Cathedral, a project that would do so much to define his career. Ah, there are a couple of seats over this side. Thank you. Um, a project that would do so much to define his career and give us all new ways of considering considering memory, monumentality, destruction and rebirth. On the night of the 14th of November, 1940, the largely undefended Coventry city centre was bombed out by the Luftwaffe, killing over 500 people and injuring many more. Though far greater raids were to occur later, particularly over Germany, for a relatively small city, the effect was devastating. The heart of one of Britain's uh, finest medieval centres was torn out and the spectacular um, perpendicular style Gothic cathedral of St Michael which you see on the on the right here a very grainy photograph but that's what it looked like was almost completely destroyed save for the spire and fragments of the stonework carapace which somehow survived the cathedral's provost provost Howard was determined to rebuild uh, the first efforts involved Giles Gilbert Scott, a very, very safe pair of hands in the cathedral architecture business. He'd done several. Um, the first efforts involved Gilbert Scott. He proposed rebuilding the former church with a pared back Gothic architecture, and this is the illustration of his proposal. Um, a streamlined Gothic architecture, if you like. Um, and it was of enormous scale and incredibly similar to the Anglican Cathedral that Scott had already done at Liverpool. Um, enter Neville Gordon, who became the new Bishop of Coventry in 1943, as early as 1943, but as the designs were progressing, he became more and more convinced that Scott's streamlined Gothic looked back, not forward, and he, uh, Gordon, was looking for a radical move to create something of the new age, not another version of what already existed, he pushed for an entirely fresh approach, a kind of new post-war Jerusalem, if you like. So Scott, in frustration, resigned. And in 1950, the RIBA were asked to stage an architectural competition, something they still do from time to time. Probably not very often do they do cathedrals. Um, they were asked to stage a, an open architectural competition, which attracted over 200 entries. What Spence did was certainly radical. He saw the power of the ruin, having long been fascinated by Rome, and he conceived of a contemporary cathedral, which you see at the top. I'll try and hopefully that little curse. So the new piece, sitting separated from the fragments of the former church by this sort of portico. So very clearly new and old separated. Um, he saw the power of the ruin, having long been fascinated by Rome, Rome and conceived of a new contemporary cathedral set to one side of the Gothic spire and the fragments of the nave. Obvious, perhaps. The idea apparently came, according to him, within about five minutes of thinking what to do. We who enter, and I know there are quite a lot of architects in the room, enter architectural competitions, steal ourselves for disappointment, and set, uh, spent similarly, was not expecting to win and was rather amazed to find that he had. Um, Coventry was an immense undertaking and he poured his energies into the project, into creating what would become a masterpiece. Whilst also, oh, there was, I should say, there was a slight problem, didn't actually have, all, didn't have the money. So some clients in the room too, that sounds quite familiar. <laughs> um, the, 
So he undertook, um, he undertook a grueling with the clergy um, fund building committee, grueling fundraising tours in all sorts of places, including three months stint in Canada, where he gave 93 lectures in three months on the emerging designs of the cathedral to try and raise the money. The man was nothing if not motivated. Um, it's worth spending just a moment, I know it's a bit fuzzy, but worth spending just a moment on the plan. This is the fragment of the old cathedral here. I think you can see, can you see the cursor? Yes, you can. And that's the spire. And this is the new plan of the cathedral with the altar at this end and the entrance here. And there's a sort of separating portico. We'll explain that in a minute. You've got a couple of chapels, the circular buildings popping off one, one, one to each side. And there are 10 sort of ziggy zaggy bits on the plan, which are these lights here. And then there's a baptistry window. Just hold that. Perspectives of the interior began to emerge, beginning to show this kind of test, not quite tessellated, but kind of um, rather complex it, uh, roof structure and the idea of the nave and the uh, columns beginning to come down to form that with Christ in glory, Graham T Sutherland's tapestry at the far end. The portico got bigged up and became uh, a huge piece, a really celebratory piece. And here, this is quite close to the final um, designs and you're even seeing Jacob Epstein's sculpture of St. Michael and the Devil appearing at the bottom of the slide there. Um, I asked you to hold the plan in your minds if you could. Um, what's extraordinary is that is the plan. If you can just see that there. It's a bit small, but that's the plan of what was built. It's almost identical in organisational terms to the competition proposal, which demonstrates two things, I think. The power of the idea that it um, could um, hold the strength of its organisation through endless committees, funding cuts, politics, God knows what, contractors, etc., etc., etc. The power of the I I idea, I guess, and also Spencer's determination to argue his case at every, every turn. So then we see um, the aerial shot of the completed building with the two chapels, the ziggurati kind of the zigzaggy kind of walls, the portico, and then the fragment. That's, a, that's not a roof, that's the floor of the old cathedral. And when you see it in 3D, it looks sort of a bit like, that way doesn't look a bit like that, it looks exactly like that. So the entrance here, and this is just a quick sort of spin around the, the project, you can begin to see the form, um, the entrance, the amazing, I, I was absolutely bowled over, I went, went again, I've been several times, but I went again recently when I was preparing this, and the quality of the stonework is quite extraordinary, Staffordshire red sandstone, it's absolutely extraordinary. Um, so the portico then, ascending the steps in the portico, you then arrive, and I've just gone up some other steps which take you to the, the ruins, but you look back at this glass screen which then takes you into the nave itself and this enormous roof um, with these huge cruciform concrete columns which come down and rest on the tiniest of pins. It doesn't hold the roof up, it's a kind of sort of grand interior design to create an effect. The roof is self-supported uh, uh, in other ways, but nevertheless it's still extraordinary to think of that kind of weight that comes down onto these tiny bronze pins. Um, as we approach then um, the choir stalls and the um, tapestry of Southern's tapestry, of which more in a moment, you begin to get the sort of the scale of it, but also the modernity, the kind of expression which is pretty much unlike any other cathedral that I could think of that predated it. So he was absolutely moving into new territory. But there are the heroic gestures, but there are these gentle things to his tiny, tiny chapel off to one side of the altar, the uh, chapel of Christ in Gethsemane with his sort of gloriously made crown of thorns, very quiet contemplative space. And externally, one of the two chapels kind of work in inverse to one another, um, which it took me a while to realize actually. But here you've got basically a glass tube, which has got these fins of stone of sort of green, green slate. And when you go inside, it creates this sort of, I'm just talking about halo, but it's not. It's an, almost like an eclipse actually, when you look up, this extraordinary kind of fan of light that comes through these walls. It's, it's really quite, quite, quite beautiful. And then, and that's at the sort of by the altar, when you turn and look back, a super distorted photograph, I, I warrant, but I wanted to be able to show the 
stained glass that comes through these sort of faceted facades that I showed earlier. And as you then begin to leave the cathedral, you see this incredible, incredibly delicate, we're in 1950s here. Um, you know, they didn't have computers, they couldn't push the glazing technology to the limits. This incredibly delicate screen, it's really quite wonderful. Um, the baptistry window with this kind of hit and miss stone um, windows. And then the other chapel, the Chapel of Unity, which is the inverse of the one you've just seen. So the other one was sort of thin ribs with loads of glass. This is loads of ribs with thin glass and the gl thin glass is all um, stained. So he plays these two games, the Chapel of Unity and the previous one. And again then the glass screen with John Hutton's engraved figures. Um, which then takes you out to the steps, which take you up to the cathedral, which is a much higher level than, than the, the old cathedral, the new one. And then this is the sort of thing that only architects ever do, which is to look up and take photographs of things not quite joining up. And it's this canopy that oversails and doesn't quite touch the old ruins. It's a kind of, you know, Sistine Chapel, Michelangelo, the, the fingers and all that move. Um, very powerfully done, and that's where you see the two, the old and the new, sort of juxtaposed. Um, and the fragments, whoops, let's get that out the way, the fragments of the old cathedral, the, the altar, and um, very poetically, nothing particularly, I think, to do with Spence, but the, and I'm not sure whether these are originals now, and whether they've been take, uh, replicated, but the cross was made of burnt rafters of the old cathedral. It's kind of quite a remarkable thing. Um, Coventry is a wondrous thing and an incredible repository of post-war art. Jacob Epstein, Graham Sutherland, who produced the Tapestry Christ in Glory, the world's at the time, I think still actually, the world's, others may correct me on that, I think it's still the world's largest tapestry, um, by um, Graham Sutherland, John Piper, Elizabeth Frink, John Hutton, who did the glass screen. Um, extraordinary. And they were either selected or championed by Spence. Um, indeed, outrageously, one of the commissioning body committee members objected to M Epstein, you know, Jacob Epstein. He was um, objected to on the, on the grounds that he was Jewish and that this was to be an Anglican cathedral. Spence famously quipped to show how he would support his people. Famously quipped that as Christ was also a Jew, that ought to be fine. <laughs> An observation that by all accounts settled the matter once and for all. So Epstein created the brilliant um, Michael's, vic Michael's victory over the devil. Clearly interpretable as an al allegory of, I don't know, Phoenix Rising or good triumphing over evil. The new cathedral was inaugurated in uh, 1962, 25th of May. Benjamin's Britons, well, they didn't muck about. Benjamin Britain was commissioned to write the war requiem. I mean, they just got everything. That was specially composed for the occasion. If you've never heard it, then please go and listen. It is stunning. Um, somehow, in this sort of miserable post-war era of austerity and general awful late 40s, 50s stuff, the architect, composer, sculptor, artist, government, clergy, contractor, craftspeople, everyone rose to the occasion and delivered something absolutely exceptional. And when he died, they thought that they should, the cathedral should mark what Spence had done. And so that's carved into the walls at the side of the portico. Um, I wonder whether, <laughs> no, actually I shouldn't wonder. <laughs> um, from 1958 to 1962, and we've crossed that over, so it's sort of almost in the run up to what I've just been speaking, at the end of what I've just been speaking about. There was quite a bit else going on, um, as well as doing Coventry and a whole host of other things we'll see. Spence was president of the RIBA from 1958 to 1960. Apparently, it was in financial crisis. Plus ça change. <laughs> um, in 1960, even though Coventry was not finished, Spence was knighted. He became a Royal Academician, a Royal Designer for Industry, and started work on Hyde Park Barracks and the embassy in, British Embassy in Rome. He was already deep into the University of Sussex project. In 1962, this is a very short period, four years, he became 
you know, he does Coventry. He becomes only the second architect after Sir Edwin Lutyens to receive the Order of Merit. He became Professor of Architecture at the Royal Academy from 1961. I don't know where the man slept, 1961 to 1968. And at some point in all that, he was a court, uh, award, uh, the Ac Academy Francaise d'Architecture honoured him with the Médaille d'Or. He became a celebrity, absolutely no question, and always made sure that he was photographed with the great and good, of which more later. I said during this period he was well into the work at the University of Sussex. The University of Sussex was f the first, and you're seeing the sort of developed master plan and the aerial shot of today, the, the core of the Spence bit, um, the University of Sussex, how am I doing for time, by the way? So I didn't really, oh, you're all right, okay. I've got, you know, got a bit to get through yet. Um, the, the University of Sussex was the first of seven post-war so-called plate glass universities. This is a name coined later by Michael Belloff, KC, who wrote a report and then wrote about them in 1970. Why plate glass? I have no idea, because mostly they're not plate glass, mostly they're brick and concrete, but the university is uh, East Anglia, that's definitely concrete, the last and stuff. Essex, Sussex, brick. Kent, Lancaster, Warwick, York, concrete and brick. In, anyway, in 1958, whilst working on Coventry and many things beside, Spence was interviewed and got Sussex, which was the first to open in 1962, with one building, possibly two, and 52 students. Um, they had rather more of both buildings and students today. Lasden got East Anglia, which opened a year or two after Sussex. Sussex was created in a kind of verdant valley at Falmer outside Brighton. Um, Spence felt that the existing rolling landscape should dominate. I know the photograph, from the photograph it, read, it doesn't look like it's very rolling, but it is when you go there and there are hills around it and the valley floor, which runs sort of along here where this spine is and then hills sort of sweep up from that low point. Um, created in a verdant valley at Falmer outside Brighton, Spence felt that the existing rolling landscape should dominate and that the building should be low rise within it and be largely made of red Sussex brick to respond to the locale. He established a master plan of quasi precinctual courtyards, which is sort of what you see here. Um, crazy precinctual courtyard set off a north-south spinal axis along the valley floor with first the gateway building, which is this one, then called College House, now called Falmer, for the student union, ending with an arts building here, um, which is kind of this one. It doesn't look like that. That was one of the earlier iterations of this project, sometimes likened to a tuning fork. Those prongs, as we'll see, do exist. They were built, although the building is different. That feature building at the head of the axis. The library, um, and even in this early drawing, actually pretty much cemented what the library looks like as built. Um, the master plan was developed with the landscape architect Sylvia Crow as a series of stepping parterres, sort of running north-south, gently stepping. The main slopes were sort of east-west, but there are steps, these levels, these plates, which step up very gently north-south. Um, the, these parterres and the axis were connected by these giant cascades and you can, of staircases. You can see them, see one of those there going up to the chemistry lecture block. And these, these sort of cascades run, uh, the plan changed uh, as was built, but you've got these every, every so often there are slots and these enormous staircases just go on and on and on up the hillside. So they form the kind of ribs which connect all the other bits of the building back to this spine. Um, We know that Spence, almost as a child actually, um, had visit, visited Fatipur Sikri um, in near Agra in Uttar Pradesh in India. Um, and this, this at least inspired the courtyard of College House um, with its sort of, re uh, with its island in the middle of water surrounded by buildings or, uh, or their college house, it's much tighter. And also to a certain extent inspired, the layout was inspired in part by this um, arrangement of courtyards and precincts which, which the ancient palace of Fatipur Sikri exhibited. 
and you can kind of see College House there and you can see that square or rectangle floating in water which becomes even more evident when you look at the, uh, the, the work there. That, so we have India influencing, in part, some of the aspects of the project. Um, that the architecture of Sussex seems also heavily influenced by early, the earlier work of Le Corbusier, and particularly his work at Maison Jaule in 1954, two houses, you're only seeing one here, but two houses um, in Paris. Uh, this is scant acknowledged, scant, scantly acknowledged, but no architect or probably anyone else can escape history's gravitational pull. So we do all stand on, to some extent, on the shoulders of giants, do we not? Um, we also know that Spence had been heavily influenced by visits to Rome, and the principle of the ruin as a guiding concept allowed him to create a spectacular entrance building of scale, College House. This is a neat architectural trick, um, because the internal program of spaces and the quantum for College House was not at that stage, and probably still to this day, is not quite big enough to build a building that would be full. So he created a kind of piece of theatre, if you like. This is not about, you know, net to gross and functionality and all this stuff. It's about establishing a gateway, a kind of symbol of Britain's first post-war new university that literally and symbolically placed the student cohort quite uniquely. Student cohort at its nexus. This is the student union building, the first that gets built. Its framework would allow expansion over time, or so it was, so it was thought. It's grade one listed now, so probably not that much expansion. <laughs> um, most of, almost all of these buildings are grade, it's one grade one, almost all of them will see a grade two star and a couple of grade twos in there. Not many are not listed. Um, powerfully expressed, employing what were to become classic Spence motifs of gentle arch-headed -head win windows, monumental bays, and muscular, uncompromising architecture of raw beauty and elegant proportion. The architect has great heft, great weight. Strong architectural ideas would be fully formed here and would appear frequently in later work. And we see Spence's architectural motifs developed here appearing on many future projects, notably Hyde Park Barretts, we'll see that in a minute, and Aden College, Durham. You have to take my word for it. I haven't got time to talk about that. As Dennis Lasden once wrote, by the time they are 40, most architects will have developed an architectural box of tricks on which to draw to create their work. Spence was no exception. Just a few more shots. And then the arts A at the head of the axis that uh, I was talking about, which became much more box-like, but the kind of the heroic peers stayed in, in place. Um, the main library on which we're working is a monumental pavilion atop an earth bank, this stepping of the valley floor upwards. Um, this sits to the west of the main axis. And Meeting House, oops, sorry, what I should say, I'm sorry, um, before I get to Meeting House, just so the way these buildings were built, this is really interesting, it just sort of takes us into the next piece. That shot on the right, this one, shows this incredibly thin concrete vault uh, uh, suspended on these beams and those are sort of dropped into this framework on the kind of left of this stuff dropped in there. Um, they were precast, I think they were precast on site, can't be absolutely sure about that, and dropped into place. So amazing kind of work with Arup, Arup to get that to, to, to work. That appears in a minute elsewhere. And then Meeting House, the only building that really is not doesn't have a hint of red brick. This is a kind of non-denominational place of worship and event contrasting in white hit and miss kind of blocks which allow you know, in a way of the hit and miss baptistry window at Coventry to bring coloured light into this amazing space. Um, the Gardner Centre, now the Attenborough Centre for the Arts arrived a little later. Um, a whole series of interconnecting brick drums of various dimensions clunking together in this quite really powerful way. Um, College House, and this is the other side of College House, with a now, not now, uh, lost pool, perhaps that might go back, we hope, became a real focus for gigs. 
Jimi Hendrix, Chuck Berry, Pink Floyd, The Clash, David Bowie, you name it. Not all at the same time, actually, which is a shame, because that would have been quite a night. <laughs> um, Sussex would also develop, very early on, cross-boundary teaching programmes and a reputation for radical activism, with students, once I understand, throwing paint over the visiting American ambassador in protest over the Vietnam War. I hope I've got that right. Um, throwing they paid for the dry cleaning. They paid for the dry cleaning. Thank you. For sure, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Alistair. So that was, their, that was okay, that was their penance. Anyway, there was this sort of virulent protest. So Just Stop Oil seemed to be borrowing some of their techniques, albeit with different objectives, um, and slightly different techniques. Uh, uh, but it all happened first at Sussex. And then just before I move on, it's very interesting how this kind of pioneering university became so celebrated through its architecture. So this is the cover of Tatler, and if you're not sure what Tatler is, Tatler is the sort of posh person's sort of magazine. Life at the New University, and I think that is July 1964, and those, the Glamour Girls are um, the J Twins. I think they're daughters of a cabinet minister. So this is sort of posh girls go to Sussex. You don't have to go to Cambridge. Sussex is just fine. And then we also have Pevner's Guide to Sussex East. It's one of the very few that actually has a post-war building on its front cover, and that's College House. So somehow these, these buildings became incredibly potent. Spence's influence was growing at a staggering pace. When in 1959 an architectural competition was run by Churchill College, Cambridge, so to honour Sir Winston, so that is a big gig. Um, it was widely ru uh, rumoured that Sir Winston was expecting a new university in his name. He wasn't paying for it, the state was paying, but it was in his name, and you know, given who he was. He expected it to be something a bit like Blenheim Palace, where he was born. <laughs> Spence, who's then president of the RAB, was having none of that. And though he did not design Churchill College, it's clear that as a competition juror, and along with Leslie Martin and others, they impacted greatly on Richard Spence's work in particular, um, uh, impacted very greatly on the winner, Richard Shepherd's work, which changed greatly over time, echoing aspects of Sussex, I feel. So here we have Richard Shepherd's winning competition entry. There's a whole other lecture on that, but brick and concrete here. But this building is a kind of white cantilevered building, and that's the kind of dining hall and social building and so on and so forth, which ended up being like that. So if you remember those vaults and those beams that you saw in um, Sussex, well, kind of there they are, some years later, crowning Churchill College. A direct lift? I don't know. The influence is, 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 is certainly, certainly there. Um, the influence is certainly there. Um, Probably necessarily Churchill, who had only recently stood down as Prime Minister for the final time, was kept remote from the building committee and the design process. But it was a high stakes game for sure, given Churchill's immense status then and now as saviour of the nation. Um, now I move into rather more dangerous territory. <laughs> Hyde Park Cavalry Barracks, Knightsbridge. Um, in 1959, you know, this is while he's doing Coventry, while he's doing Sussex, while, you know. Um, Spence was asked to start work on replacing the dilapidated, as it were, household cavalry barracks in Knightsbridge. And this is a very grainy kind of photograph of the old building. It was too small and all the rest of it. Now we think, oh, what an amazing building. We want to keep that. What can we do with it? And then it's in the way, get rid of it. New world. Um, so um, this seems to be in a direct commission by the state, championed perhaps by Lord Mountbatten, who seemed to know Spence quite well, and they'd both been in the army, and admittedly Batten, Mountbatten was a bit higher up the tree. But anyway, and they both knew the Queen, and it was all great. So off he went. Um, that's how it worked. Um, but anyway, um, he was commissioned to start work on this project. Um, and I, I said, this is dangerous ground because I think this is a building complex and it is a building complex it's not just one building it's really complicated brief 
It's often cited as one of the least liked buildings in London. But bear with me, I do think it has merit. Um, why have I lost that bit as well? I don't know what's happened to my notes. Here. Oh, hang on, where are we? Do, 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 do. Okay, I'm just going to have to speak to that one as well. So, um, so one of the early perspectives which show the, t the towers and the kind of block. So it's a household cavalry. They've got loads of horses and all the kit that goes with horses and all the rest of it. So that all has to happen at ground level. And he felt that, Spence felt, that there should be some sort of marker, some sort of celebratory tower. Um, so if you look at the locale you have and as built, you have the the tower here and this Hyde Park and the Serpentine and the complex of buildings which run along here. When you visit it, the, the thing you most notice is the tower itself and the crown, which I know was explored and explored and explored, and I'll come to the effect of that in, in a moment, but these are one of the later suite of drawings which come quite close to what was in the end actually built. Um, and there it is, the tower, which dominates, I think, the complex. At lower levels, you get a whole, s you, you get some slightly different bits of architecture, um, some stuff for people. And I think the bits where the horses are, you can't find plans of this because the army are quite twitchy about plans and reducing plans of barracks and things. So somebody else may know better, but I, I haven't been able to find them. But there are these kind of very monumental kind of brick, brick building and people kind of rail again. I'll talk about walls in a minute. No, actually, I'll leave my wall comment in a minute. And of course, as you can see, immense logistics so of all the horses from these parked up vans. So there's a kind of whole open ground level, at least a substantial portion of it, which is all about moving stuff and kit and animals and all the rest of it. Um, and um, a great insistence on the part of the client, the cavalry. It's a very conservative kind of taste military I guess but so they insisted I think rightly actually that they kept that bit <laughs> conservation or what <laughs> that bit and they really liked that and stuck it there and I think France, Spence was pretty angry about this and he couldn't really work out what to do but anyway he gave in and that's what he used to make the portico which in 1970 when it was open presaged postmodernism and all that stuff that, you know, quite accidentally, I think it's part of his ethos, but it clearly is, clearly kind of presaged it accidentally, but it does give an extraordinary kind of identity to this sort of suite of buildings, and behind that is kind of service yards and all the rest of it. Um, and then we get to the internal programme, and the, I love this drawing. You, it may not be entirely distinct, but what you're looking at is jumping horses, and there are horses that are jumping between um, barriers with no steps. So they just jump, jump, hop, them, hop over them, or they don't jump, they leap over them. And there's others where they've got two steps, and there's others where they've got one step, and some where they're mixed up. And all that's worked out to make sure that all the training that the horses get and the troopers get actually works in this kind of space. I just think it's extraordinary drawing. Um, and then we have these kind of really quite aggressive cantilevering beams, but really well organized and controlled. And this kind of brick wall and elsewhere railings screen because you have to screen off the public and keep all that stuff to a, a considerable extent hidden away, I guess. I suppose I'm just gonna use this moment to talk about walls because there is this kind of prevailing orthodoxy in planning that we should always enliven the street, that everything has to be active, but actually, <coughs> I don't think we should fear the wall if it's done well. You know, we go to Rome, we go to, like this, you know, go to Siena, it's full of walls. They're great. It's fine. Not everything needs to be glass fronted and have boots and necks and all the rest of it. In fact, we won't have those because they, you know, there is not enough stuff to activate all our street frontages. So we have to find other ways of doing it. And actually, Spence wasn't really thinking about it in this way, but I think the effect is actually really quite powerful. So, okay. Good for him. And the motifs I spoke of earlier, you can see that these buildings sail across the site from, uh, on these massive kind of vaults and, and beams, this kind of architectural box of tricks that I was speaking of, which Fence kind of deployed. Um, 
the, the kind of whole complex is a bit fragmented at ground level. It could, perhaps could have done with greater unity, perhaps that came from some of his earlier drawings. And the tower, perhaps, if you want to criticise, doesn't quite ground aesthetically to my eye. But then it has to sit behind a wall, so maybe that is probably all right. Um, so the other drawing that I really love from all this is this one on the left, which is the kit that troopers have. So if you... I, you know, never been in the military. If I were in the household cavalry, cavalry, I'd have all that stuff, which is lots of different types of boots, some high boots, some no low boots, some like boot boots, various caps, um, tunics of certain length, and, and one of those nice shiny brass helmets with a plume on the top. And it's all got to fit somewhere. And everyone has to be the same because it's the military. I'm just one foot drawing. And all of the, each one of those sits in one of these spaces up here. So you, in this tower, you've got these very kind of bedrooms and bulks and all the normal stuff and one of those cupboards with all that glorious stuff in it and and it's all organized in this um, quite simple tower now I'm just wondering yes yeah, so I'm going to move on because I'm just going to talk about the composition of the tower very briefly um, and then I suppose when time softens then you see the tower and the lower piece juxtaposed against the park now people have I'm going to make a case for saying this is actually a really skillfully composed tower. So you've got all that quite ordinary stuff in the tower, you know, floors and floors and floors. It's all rep repetitious. Why couldn't you stick it at the lower level? Maybe you could have done. But what's interesting about this tower is what Spence has done with it. So its program is quite ordinary, but he's given it a crown. And it's a crown of interle interlocking facets or plates, uh, which give it a really interesting skyline. And the other thing he's done is to then carry these little white lines, these plates of concrete, some quite pronounced, to further to the ground. You split up the facade. And what that does is to trick the eye into thinking that the building is taller and more elegant and thinner than it actually is. And it's really masterful. And then when you stand away, the only thing you can see on this skyline is this tower just protruding from the trees. And when you go to the northeast off Park Lane, you see it at the, not quite at the head of this part, but it just comes above the trees. And I think the, the challenge for anyone creating a tower is actually to make the skyline, which is a public asset, that bit more beautiful than had you not been there. Mostly that's not done. I actually think that this contributes a real, really positive move in the city. So I think. I think this is a really skilled piece of work, and I hope those thoughts are helpful. Um, getting toward the end, I think, 15 minutes or so, um, bear with me. Spence was under quite a lot of pressure. Private Eye, Queen Anne's Gate, a project he'd been working on on and off for quite a while. So this is another difficult one, so I'm doing the two difficult ones last before I just briefly talk about Sussex and a close out and I'll be brief on this one. This was a weird one. So Spence was becoming a bit of a consultant and the kind of go-to man to get planning permission because he knew everybody and the Royal Fine Arts Commission and all that stuff. So Fitzroy Robinson, the architects, was struggling to get a speculative project through on Queen Anne's Gate near St James Park um, and so Spence was asked to help um, and so he did. Um, and when, I suppose this is July 72, would anyone know, was that Gavin Stamp writing Pilotti at that time in private? I really can't, Roberts, that's the sort of thing you might know. I'm hoping, no, no, he doesn't, okay. Um, the, um, anyway, um, in private eye, they decide to get stuck into Sir Basil and there he is sitting at his drawing board, at least as in envisaged, and they pen the ballad of Sir Basil Spence, which goes, but a whisper grew in London town and soon grew to a spate that the dreadful thing that Sir Basil planned would ruin Queen Anne's gate. He was criticised after this was done by, by Lord St. John of Palsy, who was then chairman of the Royal, Royal Fine Arts Commission, saying his, his unique achievement was to ruin two royal parks, Hyde Park with Hyde Park Barracks and St. James Park with um, uh, this project which I'm about to show you. But again, let's just have a closer look. So this is one of the early drawings of Queen Anne's Gate, which I'll 
in fact, I'll locate it for you first. So it's this one here, this, this kind of monster block, um, which has been occupied by government departments pretty much since it was open. It's currently got the Ministry of Justice. It was the Home Office. And immediately in front of it is Goodhart Rendell's really brilliant 1950s um, chapel for the, uh, the Guards Chapel. So this is all the guards along here. So it's this really, really, really big block. And you've got some quite important neighbours as well who were sort of fussed about about things around about that time, and this is St. James Park. So let me go back a bit. So this is one of Spencer's studios, Spencer's offices, early drawings about, it's quite really kind of bold. It looks like to me like it's drawn in a kind of tempo ink, that pen that people were used a lot at that, that time, kind of really bold and powerful thing. Um, but what was this building replacing? So this is a view from Buckingham Palace, and this is interesting because this is, uh, historically, I think an early indication that people were starting to worry about scale and you had to kind of indicate how your drawings were going to look, uh, at least give an <coughs> indication of the massing. Um, and what's interesting here is that the building that this building replaced was not that remarkable and the scale is not that different. And Spence felt, although he kind of was unable to kind of alter the the plan too much, he felt that actually what was really important was about this building, this tower, these towers were three things, the top, bottom and middle. It's very, very simple, this architecture business, but it's the kind of the most difficult thing to do. And um, controversially, he felt that actually the best way of doing this was to make the top smaller than the middle, which is not very often done. Um, he would have known about the Torre Valesca in Milan, which is mid fifties building. Um, and he kind of worked away trying to create a quite a simple block, but actually they're very fine materials in fact, a simple block with these, the top, middle and bottom very, very clearly expressed. And this is going back, so you know, this building would have been hammered for saying, God, the street's awful, it's defensive and you know, there's no joy and all the rest of it. Well, it's not quite true because as you go down the street, there's lots of glass. But again, it goes back to my bit, we cannot activate every single street front, so we have to find a way architecturally of, of handling this. So he created these incredibly powerful forms, these monumental kind of bays of uh, build, uh, to give real kind of rhythm. So you've got a lot of quite complicated things going on, a tight rhythm of the bays here, larger kind of TV boxes, if you like, sitting on these, on these columns, quite extraordinary composition. And actually what I didn't tell you earlier, which I neglected to say, was just opposite is Charles Holden's amazing um, London Underground building as was. And the texture and coloration and the scale seemed to work extremely well. Um, and then just going back to, and then seeing how that softens over time. Going back to then one of the big concerns at the time, the scale effect on Buck House. Um, and here we're looking from Buck House, not my photograph very clearly, but that is my photograph and it's not quite in the same position. But what you do see are the tops of these buildings and Spence was determined, he felt that, that working on those tops in that particular way was not just about the immediate street, but it was actually about the wider perspective, the wider vista and how that would look and how that would sit amongst the other kind of monuments. And I actually think it really, again, surprisingly kind of really enhances the skyline, perhaps more successfully than other more recent projects. But here we have obviously the Palace of Westminster, the Victoria Monument, one of the um, pilast uh, the piers outside Buck House, Buckingham Palace, and then obviously the spent stuff, which is all in there. So maybe, maybe we shouldn't worry too much about that. I'm just going to rattle. So, so again, a difficult project, and I can absolutely see why people find these buildings really difficult. But actually what I'm trying to do is just lift the lid a bit and just see if we can find the merits. And I think there are considerable merits in both of them. I think they're much finer buildings than perhaps popular culture would suggest. I'm just going back very briefly then to Sussex before I close out. Um, I did mention that I would um, talk briefly about Sussex. I need some water actually, bear with me. Uh, ha -ha. I kept it out there because there's no table and I'm worrying about throwing it on the, electri on the electronics here. Okay, um, so this is Sussex now. Brighton and Hove Football Stadium, Hove Albion Football Stadium, the uh, A27, the train line, Fulmer Station, and Sussex. And very roughly, the Spence bit is that. So it's got a bit bigger. And the Spence bit is that, with Meeting House here, um, College House, Fulmer, 
the Attenborough Arts Centre and the library, which we're looking at an arts A. So the library is this kind of very muscular, powerful building of brickwork with these huge kind of gently arched blocks of concrete sitting about. It's an incredibly powerful thing. And it sits like a pavilion to knowledge on this grassed bank. And it's got these thumping great staircases which take you up, stairs which take you up to it, which is absolutely fantastic unless you have to be in a wheelchair. And as I said earlier, they just didn't worry about stuff like that. So part of our gig is to sort of, as well as looking at cleaning the building and scraping away the, accretion, scraping away the accretions and decarbonising it and looking at greening and all that stuff, um, is to try and fix the access, um, which is, sounds easy but sort of isn't. And even when you get to show how complicated it can be, even when you get to these, the top of these steps, and there's absolutely no way of getting there in a wheelchair at the moment, you have to go around the back by the dustbins. That's not a criticism of the university, it's just a criticism perhaps of the original designs when people didn't worry about stuff like that. Um, even when you get up onto this deck, the bridge deck, at the top of the steps, there's still two more steps to get in. So, the, so even if you get everyone up there, you've still got, it's still absolutely useless because you still can't get in the front door without ramping or doing something. Anyway, but, okay, that, so that's beating the, the project, and clearly it needs a good wash and brush up, it's obvious, obvious, but um, it's 60 odd years old now. But inside there are these glorious kind of atria, there are three like this, there's some open courtyards, one of which has been roofed, there are two other courtyards, one's been roofed in, glazed roof in for the cafe, but there are three of these, which are an amazing study centre, study spaces, and you see the concrete and the brickwork invading the interior as well to create that, that kind of, you know, really holistic aesthetic. And if you really dig around in dark cupboards, you can find these amazing chairs which Spence designed with these beautiful kind of pinned, I think they're oak and leather, uh, really beautiful chairs. Anyway, uh, that's probably a bit small to explain. I might have to skip through, but we're, we're basically trying to clip a new bit on the, is that, is that vaguely discernible? Not really. Mm. Anyway, that's the facade, I'll try. That's the facade, and what we're, what we're proposing to do, and what we've been discussing with the university, is to put in a new tower, which will, a low tower, which will deal with, um, a circular brick tower, which will deal with lifts and so on, and there's a kind of new walkway, um, which will sit in front of, that's probably a bit easier to see, there we are, which will sit in front of the, um, uh, the universe, uh, of, the, of the library. And what, that, what we're doing is, is basically, we're not trying to take the outside in, we're trying to bring the inside out. So the library floor level comes out of the building and it becomes this top level, which runs along here. So library square, which is the, the sort of pivotal space in Spencer's master plan, gives access to the stairs. And what it will do, we hope, is to give access to this brick tube, which kind of borrows heavily, I think, from the motifs that Spencer's employed across the campus and then we'll connect bridge uh, by bridge to either the library or more widely, let's go back one, more widely to the other building. So it's a kind of master plan move as well as a, a how do I get into the library move. It starts to join up bits of the campus which were pre previously unjoined. And then you get into the discussion about where do you put this um, drum. And there's a sweet spot which is really interesting the, on, the, on the campus, so I talked about those sort of s cascades of steps beforehand that were part of Crow and Lasden's, uh, uh, and Spence's master plan. And you can see one here, just you've seen that before, but going up past the chemistry block and there are a number of others. And what's interesting is that on the centre of that, there, is, there was and is a path which was part of the original plan and it just stops in Library Square and we're just going to carry it on and so, oops, carried on, so that actually this starts to turn, this new drum starts to terminate the access. Is that, is it all too small to be, is that clear? Or is it visually clear, is that okay? Yeah, okay. So then if you take the elevation, and what's interesting about the elevation is that you've got these uh, 15 bays of vaulted vaults at the roof, these kind of flat arches, if you go, there, there are 15, trust me. Um, and then you get a load of brick with some windows in and then you get a sort of white bit at the bottom actually it's not white it's, it's gray when you go there but it's concrete so you've got concrete bit brick concrete whichever order you take it in all sitting on this grass mound that's incredibly important for us visually defining kind of character of the project and the sweet spot for this here drum that i've been banging on about um, is on this axis but actually we can also get it to sit symmetrically on these two uh, on these two um, 
the cent on, on the pilaster at the centre of those two um, curved windows, which seems very important. And we may, well, through this kind of piece of new infrastructure, if you like, we can sit on top of the existing concrete plinth, which, which is just really services. So we carry that architectural principle forward. So what we're trying to do is to sort of to achieve quite a lot by the most minimal means possible and preserve the char characteristics of the architecture. And very roughly, it might look something like that, some posher drawings in a moment. And then we're beginning to look at the inside. So I've just clipped on the bit that we've just been talking about, this extension to the square, the new tower, this walkway, and so on and so forth. Let's go back. And then we're talking about maybe dropping some helical stairs, which is a kind of very traditional library thing to do in university libraries, 19th, 18th, 19th century. Can we drop those into some of those atria that we're just looking at? And we think you could split them on, on axis and have two, which would um, really improve accessibility through, not for people in wheelchairs, but the kind of, what I should, accessibility is the wrong word, permeability, because you walk into this enormous building, it's incredibly hard to find your way from one floor to another. I should say that the Spence architecture stops about there. There was a 1995 extension to it, which is OK. Um, but this is intended to look at the library holistically. Functionally, it's absolutely great for the library, I, I believe. And then we're looking at putting in new lifts, which will greatly improve the connectivity for everybody once you've actually got to this point. So there's this kind of through route from the square up in the lift right through, and then that gives you connectivity in your wheelchair or whatever, right up through the building. So we're trying uh, through fairly simple direct means to transform the experience of being there and very roughly then when you put all that together externally at least it might look something a bit like that so we're in discussions with planning authorities which is moving positively and we expect to be putting a planning application I think in fairly shortly to begin to get some of those things to happen the final years and the legacy Spence's work so uh, what I should say is it's an, an immense privilege. You have to think very carefully about all those moves that you make on these incredibly important buildings. That's grade two star listed. So you, have to, you are walking on eggshells when you propose anything on these buildings. And to trying to do it in the spirit of, but not to mimic Spence, I think is the, the trick that we're trying to pull off. You know, we'll see, if, see if what people think as to whether we, we, we get there. The final years and the legacy. So Spence's work continued internationally and commissions included the new Parliament building in Wellington, the so-called Beehive, which you see it's fairly self-evident there. Um, the so-called Beehive. Um, banks in Greece, cultural centres in the Middle East, as well as many commissions in the UK. His office peaked at around, I think, about 80 staff in a couple of locations, one in Scotland and down in Edinburgh and two in London. And he was under increasing pressure from many quarters as cost overruns on the Hyde Park barracks and the Rome Embassy were laid firmly at his door. And his work was starting to fall out of favour as the conservation movement started to gain traction. Stung by the criticism of his work, he withdrew somewhat and became more of a consultant designing projects worldwide but relinquishing considerable control in so doing. He spent some months of the year at his house in Malta, but a furious and relentless workload took its toll eventually and, and burnt out. He died from cancer in 1976 at the relatively young age of 69. My God, he achieve a lot in that time. Um, so to try to conclude and draw the threads together, um, let me try and answer my own question. Basil Spence, radical or reactionary? The first part is almost easier to answer than the second. Radicalism is often accompanied by a clear manifesto or, st or statement of intent. Think Dadaism or Futurism or the exhortations of Le Corbusier. Spence didn't, as far as I know, publish one. But then perhaps you might say the same of Zaha Hadid. Both, I think, changed the course in different ways of architectural history. Spence's radicalism did not seek to travel a particular road other than to bring an appropriate architecture, for, as he saw it, for a new Elizabeth, Elizabethan post-war age to bring that to the world. He captured the zeitgeist, but not necessarily of international movement architectural orthodoxy, which had been prevailing to pretty much to that time. His draw on the history of architecture was very learned and also intuitive. It was eclectic. And as I hope I've shown, at times pioneering, it was at times romantic and contextual with a great concern 
for the history and beauty and the human spirit as he understood them. His, earlier work, his early work was highly conventional and somewhat bourgeois, but then so was that of Le Corbusier. Spence was a superb draftsman and a watercolorist, schooled in the convention of that medium and the training at the time, which was fairly standard, but he was exceptional. Um, but his work for sure can be considered brutal, insensitive, or more bombastic when you are trying to change, but when you are trying to change things, there will inevitably be fallout. Um, his tastes appear to merge the traditional with the contemporary, and he was certainly, which is, I guess, what you'd expect given what I've just said, and he was certainly criticised for living and working in leafy Canterbury in near Islington, or part of Islington, leafy Canterbury, that's the sort of his house at the top left there with the blue plaque on it, um, whilst creating now demolished, powerful, brutalist tower block homes in the Gorbals. Somebody mentioned those earlier in discussion, now demolished. But he also built himself a holiday home in Bewley in Hampshire, in a kind of cool modern, and the rugged home in Malta, which I've mentioned, seemingly hewn from cliffs. He was a relentless self-publicist in the era before selfies, long before selfies. <laughs> and he ensured that he was photographed with the great and good of the time, including Winston Churchill here, um, the actor Richard Burton on the set of Beckett, uh, who played uh, um, Archbishop of Canterbury, one of the most famous actors on the planet at the time. The Kennedys, the Queen, etc., etc. Um, he mixed with the great white gods of modern architecture at Hyannis Port, the Kennedy home, when they were all considering what to do, how to build the Kennedy Centre after Jack's assassination. So here you have Bobby Kennedy, Jackie Kennedy, <laughs> Edward Kennedy, Louis Kahn, Ian Pei, who in the end got the gig, which is a bit of a pity because he isn't great, um, an ailing Mies van der Rohe, and I think that's Alto. And Spence isn't in the shot because he was taking it, but he made up for it later and put himself centre stage with the um, uh, centre stage amongst the adoring Kennedy women who no doubt were fascinated to meet a real knight of the realm, a kind of Sir Lancelot moment. <laughs> um, his overspanned embassies, airports, hospitals, universities, and nuclear power station cultural centres, office buildings, housing projects, parliament buildings, churches, and one cathedral. It's not bad for <laughs> one, man, one, one studio's work. Many of his projects are now listed, and it's my privilege to be working in that context at Sussex. What is evident is that Spence's restless effort to try and achieve a kind of perfection in his work, designing and redesigning his projects many times, drove him to search for new architectural worlds. As with many great architects, not everything he did reach the highest level. Um, and there are some projects that are just difficult to like. Um, but the more I look at the embassy in Rome and the New Zealand Parliament we've just, under, we've just seen, the more you stare at them, you, at least I better, I think, understand the aesthetic complexities and the extraordinary geometric power that he delivered on, 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 these, on, on these projects, um, on, on these major projects. I think Spence, rode two horses, so I'm having both reactionary and radical. He did both. He became an establishment figure and used his status to push an agenda of expressive radical architecture, an architecture that vaulted the accepted aesthetic boundaries and shifted conservative tastes of governments and committees, persuading that the buildings that they commissioned had to reflect the new post-war age. Spence was relentless in his efforts to create a new architectural orthodoxy that was genuinely post-war 20th century. So at his best, he left us with some of the finest post-war buildings created, along and along with others. Change the course of architectural history. To end, I want to go back almost to the beginning in Coventry. Um, <coughs> What Spence did there was to confront catastrophe and record it in a, in a visceral way through the preservation of remnant and ruin as a testament to loss, while symbolizing hope and rebirth through a new architecture which engaged with, but sat apart from, the historic. It is an immensely 
powerful architectural and cultural trope, whose strident message continues to endure both at Coventry and in its reinterpretation as the means of recording the tragedy of the Twin Towers and 9-11. The parallels, in my view, are hard to miss. Thank you.